Uh, good afternoon, good evening, and good morning, depending on where you are joining this webinar. Welcome to LMU's special lecture series on international business and regional studies. My name is Young Sun Pak. I'm a professor of international business and management and director of the Center for Asian Business and also the Center for International Business Education of Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, California. Today's program is funded by DK Kim Foundation, a gracious benefactor of the Center for Asian Business for past seven years and sponsored by the LMU Center for International Business Education. Center for Asian Business was established in 1995 to promote better understanding between the US and Asian countries through multiple channels, including international business courses, faculty research grants, student scholarships, special lectures and movie screenings. LMU is among the 16 universities in the nation who received prestigious cyber grants awards from the US Department of Education. The LMU CYBE serves as regional as well as national resources to students, faculty, and business practitioners through international business and area study education, boarding language training, and research capacities. Today, we have a great program for you. We are very fortunate to have two experts on international trade and foreign direct investment for the state of California. California would be number five economy in the world if it were a country. It is the second largest exporting state after Texas. California's major trading partners are mainly from East Asia. Apart from our two neighboring countries, Mexico and Canada, Japan, China, South Korea, and Taiwan, they rank among the top trading partners with California. It is crucial to, for the growth of Californian economy to continue to increase exports and attract FDI. It would be very interesting to hear what kinds of programs are available to support our local companies who are interested in expanding their businesses through exports. Now, it's my great pleasure to introduce our two speakers today. Our first speaker, Ms. Hannah Lee. She serves as the Asia Trade and Investment Representative for the International Affairs and Trade Team at the California Governor's Office of Business and Economic Development, often abbreviated as GoBiz. She's responsible for managing the state's export promotion initiatives to the Asia Pacific Rim region and foreign investment attraction efforts from the same region, as well as the broader international affairs strategy with Asian countries and regions. She brings more than 14 years of experience in international business development, trade promotion initiatives, and project management in both the public and private sectors. Now, our next speaker, Mr. Maurice Cogan. He's president of Cogan Trading Consulting. He has spent over 60 years in the international business field as a US government official, business executive, educator, and consultant. Mr. Cogan's US government career spanned over 33 years between 1961 and 94 with the US Department of Commerce, where he oversaw many of the agency's expert strategic planning trade information, and expert assistance services. He also directed El Camino College Center for International Trade Development. Mr. Kogan has written and lectured extensively on international trade, including his How to Export book, Roadmap to Export Success. He has taught international business courses at Cal State University in Northridge, Georgia Washington University, and Virginia Tech. And he also served as a guest lecturer at LMU. He's currently an LMU side advisory board member. Well, Hannon and Maurice, thank you so much for joining the panel today. Hannon, would you please introduce your work at the governor's office first? Thank you so much, um, Professor Park. I really appreciate the introduction. Um, Jennifer, if you could help me uh, play my presentation. That'll be wonderful. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Hanan Lee. I'm the Trade and Investment Representative for Asia at California Governor's Office of Business and Economic Development, or GOBIS. It's my great pleasure to join today's program and share with you about our office, 
service and resources uh, we have to support California business to expand the global market, as well as help international business to invest in California. Next. GoBiz um, serves as a state leading agency for job growth, economic development, and the businesses and endeavors. We have several units and teams covering international affairs and trade, business investment service, permit and regulatory assistance, small business advocacy, zero emission vehicle market development, tax credit, and grant opportunities. Next. The International Affairs and Trade Unit, which I'm with, advised the state leadership on international affairs and trade issues, implements strategies to develop and grow international relationships and engagement with foreign partners, and provides recommendations to promote and expand California's trade and foreign investment portfolio. Our work has three major pillars. Number one is export promotion, supporting small business in accessing global markets, through California step grant funding. The second is foreign direct investment attraction, bringing in foreign investment and creating jobs in California by providing one-on-one -on -one consultation and complementary investment service and resources. The third is engaging in subnational diplomacy and the business engagement, support the state leadership on international two-way trade missions and delegation visits, event planning, as well as international agreement support. Recently, we also added a new immigration integration portfolio, which supports equitable economic development opportunities in the states, policy programming for California's immigrant population. Next. Our state plays an outsized role on the global stage, whether it's our shared border with the country's most significant trading partner, our strategic position on the Pacific Rim. Uh, California lies on the west coast of the United States, and we are the most populous U.S. state and third largest by area. If California were a sovereign nation, uh, we would rank in terms of GDP as the world's fifth largest economy, only after U.S., China, Japan, and Germany. Next. As the most diverse state in the U.S., minority is our majority. Over 44% of Californians speak more than one language at home. With the shared language, value, and understanding, international business find it's easier to start and connect and flourish in our state compared to other states. Over 40% of California small business are minority-owned. Nationwide, about 25% of new companies are founded by immigrants. In California, it's 42%. Our state is home to more than 800,000 immigrant entrepreneurs. Next. We are a national leader of, uh, in two-way trade and the top state uh, exporter in 26 industries. About 5 million of California jobs are supported by trade and IPI, which come for about a third of the total employment. In 2022, we exported 9% of total U.S. exports and import about 16% of total U.S. imports. Among these, 55% of all California's two-way trade is with East Asian countries, with a total value of 386 billion. Some of the top commodities we trade, including computer and electronic products, transportation equipment, machinery, manufactured commodities, agricultural products, and chemicals. Next. California is also the number one state for jobs supported by foreign direct investment in the US. FDI plays a key role to ensure California's economic growth and prosperity, growing innovation, driving exports, and creating high-paying jobs. More than six, 600,000 California jobs are supported by more than 18,000 foreign-owned firms. Next. Um, today, I'd like to elaborate a little more on our FDI and export resources. GoBiz is the sole administrator of California State Trade Expansion Program, or STEP Grant, under the collaborative agreement with the U.S. Small Business Administration. This grant program aims to increase the number of small business exporters, as well as increase the volume of goods and service to export. On an average year, our team supports over 150 California small business, with funding to participate in international trade shows or trade missions 
U.S. commercial service export products, such as Gold Key service for matchmaking, compliance testing and IP protection, sample shipping, international marketing material translation, website globalization, e-commerce, exempt banks export credit insurance, and other export research tools. The beneficiary of California STEP programs are U.S. incorporated for-profit small business class B standard with a significant operation in California, exports goods or service of U.S. origin or have at least 51% U.S. content. The business also needs to be in good standing with the California Secretary of State and in business for at least one year. Next. There are two ways company could apply for that grant to support their export activities. First is participating in upcoming step events or trade missions. To bolster California's critical sectors, GoBiz frequently collaborates with U.S. Commercial Service and the other trade promotion partners to establish a California pavilion at international trade shows or facilitate the participation for California delegations in international trade mission. In this way, California STEP program will cover a portion of the participation fee on behalf of the business, therefore reducing the overall cost. The second form is um, provided through the California Step Voucher Program. Eligible companies can propose their own export promotion activities and have the opportunity to compete for funding to get reimbursed for 75% of pre-approved expenses with a maximum li limit of 10,000 um, grants. The allocation of funding for the export voucher is highly competitive and each application will be evaluated based on the strengths of the proposal, the number of the applicants, and the availability of the funding. Next. Our office also developed a variety of resources to help international business to get started in our state. And we also offer a complimentary one-on-one -on -one consultation. These resources include a foreign direct investment starter packet, which provides an overview of GoBiz service and the first steps necessary for business to register and get started in California. An international business success story page highlights the reasons why international business choose California and how they grow in the state. A business investment guide updated annually and contains a comprehensive summary of incentive programs available to business in the state based on sector and location. Next. For international business who are interested in landing our state, we could help with confidential business set section across the California regions, permit and regulation assistance, and the business incentive program navigation. A, mem a number of our state incentive programs are geared toward amplifying innovation and supporting job growth in our state. For example, we have California Competes Tax Credit Program. It's an income tax credit available to business that want to locate in California or stay and grow in our state. We have EPP, Employment Training Panel Program, provides funding to employers to assist in upgrading the skills of their workers. Next. This concludes my presentation today and happy to answer any question. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Hannah. Uh, that was very succinct presentation about your, you know, work that um, you're trying to do help the local companies here to promote their exports and attract the FDI from abroad. Now I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Kogan. Um, you know, would you please that uh, present uh, some of the materials you prepared that uh, so that students can understand better about what's required to become a successful exporting companies and um, how they can cultivate their career if anybody's interested in pursuing the career in international trade. Okay, well, thank you very much um, for uh, SIBE, LMU SIBE for hosting this webinar. It's a very important topic and it's a, very, a topic very little understood uh, by Americans and particularly uh, students. Uh, and uh, what I'm going to try to do in the next 15 minutes is run you through a, a light, somewhat lightning speed uh, what's going on or what's not going on. I would like to put it in the export world. 
uh, how much we're losing out that people are not aware of and what opportunities that might uh, present for uh, students coming out of their schools and looking for very interesting jobs. So if we could um, put up the uh, first uh, slide. Uh, and while we're doing that, um, do we have that? Uh, years ago, uh, I, I kind of coined a, a phrase, uh, uh, our national export paradox. I said, we are a very large uh, exporting nation and a very large uh, manufacturing nations. We are number two in both, very large in both, but not a nation of exporters. And what I mean by that is despite all of the high uh, numbers of, uh, of uh, exports and manufacturing, only 25% of American manufacturers are exporting. That means 75% are just selling in the United States. Okay, so as you look at this um, uh, little sliver uh, at the bottom on the left, that blue thing, that's the US uh, market. If you look at next to it, that's the world market. And uh, uh, the Americans, to the extent of um, uh, 70, uh, uh, 25% are not exporting to that very large uh, orange group. 75% are losing out, uh, not, ex not even trying to export to that large group. And we, th that uh, also represents two thirds of the world's purchasing power. Uh, so the, the, the point I, I'd like to make initially to get more perspective is um, uh, we, we've got to we've got to change that dynamic somehow. We've got to get more companies not exporting into exporting. So if you think about it, uh, we are uh, one country that we're selling to. There are almost 200 countries uh, outside the U.S. we're not selling to. They are the ones that represent the 95 percent. Uh, there's about $17 trillion in, in demand uh, for imports by foreign countries. They are buying $17 trillion worth of goods to some extent from the United States. But just think of uh, those uh, five, uh, those uh, 95%, uh, I'm sorry, the 75% uh, are, are not taking advantage of that uh, $17 trillion in, in foreign, uh, foreign demand. Uh, so um, uh, the question is, what, what are we gonna, you can go to the, the next slide because now we wanna explore why is this happening? What, what is accounting for this paradox? Why are so few American manufacturers um, exporting? Uh, and I should say, uh, even those that are exporting the 25%, over half of them are only exporting to two countries. They already know how to export, but they're not taking advantage of the huge number of other countries they could be exporting to. Whereas the 75% uh, that are not exporting at all, um, uh, all, if they could even start with Mexico or Canada, let's say, to, to get their feet wet, that would not would help. So what are the excuses? You know, you always ask around, why are, why are you <laughs> missing out on these opportunities? Can't you see it in front of you? The, why are you just selling to 5% of your potential when you could be selling to 95% of others. So they, they usually come out with a bunch of uh, excuses as you ask, ask them, and none of those make any sense. And here they are, a little kind of cartoonish shown. Uh, some of them say, well, I'm too small uh, to export, only the big guys export. Uh, whereas in fact, uh, even though only 25% export, uh, over 95% of those that do export are small businesses. Well, that's just mathematical or arithmetic that there are not that many large businesses in the United States. Uh, so you would expect that. So it, it, it's not the smallness of the company that has any effect whatsoever on your ability to export. It's the product that you make and whether that product is exportable. And if you can sell it in the United States, why can't you sell it export uh, elsewhere? Uh, another, uh, another excuse is uh, exporting is too risky. Now we're talking from a level of ignorance because they haven't done it. So this is, you're just assuming things, it's too risky. They mean by that, well, what if I sell it to somebody overseas and I don't get paid? What if I, uh, what if I start uh, going to another market and they rip me off with my uh, patent? Uh, well, they, they're not aware of all the protections that are available uh, to prevent uh, that. Those risks can be mitigated. 
including non-payment uh, risks and uh, intellectual property risk. And we'll try to get into that as we go along. Uh, I can't afford it. Yeah, uh, I, you know, it must cost a bundle uh, uh, to try to get into exporting. Uh, you know, if you try to go to a trade show overseas, it'll probably cost you uh, $10,000 <laughs> just for a booth. You got to get there with the plane. You got to stay there. You got to eat. Uh, we can't afford all that. Well, uh, that's because they don't know that there are lots of ways short of that uh, to get into exporting that don't cost anything or a very low cost. I can't explain all of all of this now, but I'm just telling you that, that that's the case. Another is, uh, oh, it's too complicated. I, you know, I, I know how to deal with the American market, but there are probably too many regulations and documentation. <laughs> Excuse me, all that paperwork. Yes, there are uh, regulations and there is paperwork. But guess what? You're usually not the one to have to deal with that. You use a, a freight forwarder or somebody like that to, to handle the so-called complications. They prepare the paperwork and they tell you what regulations exist and uh, they can help you comply with the regulations. So that should not be a deterrent. <clears throat> Another one is, uh, oh, I can't compete. Now look at all this stuff. Every time you go into a store, you put, pick up the label and it's not made in the U.S. Uh, how can I possibly compete against all those uh, when they're flooding our imports? Well, guess what? If you've been successful in the United States for all these years, and we're talking about the 5% that are successful in the United States, they're just not exporting. Well, who do, they, who do you think you're competing against when you're selling in the United States? It's foreigners as well as Americans. And so you're going to face the same competition overseas. And if you can, if you've survived uh, in the U.S. against that competition, no reason to think you couldn't uh, survive um, outside the United States. Okay, so let's go into uh, uh, well, basically what I'm saying is all of those excuses of of why I limit myself to five percent of my potential don't really make any sense. And we can help you in much more time guide through all those uh, those, those things to try to help you. Once you come into the door and say, yes, maybe I'll give it some thought, <clears throat> we can walk you through all the steps that are needed. And if we get to the, <coughs> excuse me, the next slide, we're going to do a kind of a lightning, uh, a lightning, uh, uh, next slide, please, the, the, um, the, the table. What, what it represents, if it comes up, are what I call five stages of export development. A company not yet exporting is going to have to go through five stages. There we go. Okay. You see the five stages. Uh, at each stage, you're going to have to accomplish something in order to be able to get to the next stage. And when you get to the next stage, you're going to have to go through those things to get to the third stage, the fourth stage, and finally the fifth stage. Okay. So uh, there's a lot here, and I'm going to run it through very quickly, and maybe some of this will come out in, in Q&A. But anyway, at stage one, remember, you're not exporting. You're just selling to the U.S. You're selling successfully to the U.S., but now you want to export or think about exporting. So the first thing you want to do is look at your company. Uh, am I ready to export? Do I have an exportable product? Chances are you do have an exportable product. If you're selling it successfully in the United States, you'll find the same kind of customers outside the United States that like the same uh, a product that you're already selling here. So uh, th that that should be a, a no no brainer. Uh, so you probably do have export potential for the product. Is your company ready? Well, you need to uh, you need to be able to will uh, willing to take some help to guide you through these these kinds of steps to become export ready. Uh, for example, uh, you, you want to assess your readiness. There is a diagnostic tool for that that will say, uh, well, uh, if I'm going to be export ready, in other words, able to handle all these things and export it, I need to be able to do this, that, or that. Not as difficult as you might uh, might think, uh, think. So you can you can be helped along the way with export counselors at, at uh, the Commerce Department, the SBA, and all those places. Um, and... Uh, uh, to uh, to and, and go and take courses or or go to seminars or webinars like this uh, uh, to to help guide you and educate you on the mechanics of exporting until you have a basic understanding of what it's going to take knowledge and skills to be an exporter. And the other thing, uh, once you learn the mechanics, the basics of exporting, and there's lots of free help there, you're you're going to want to line up a team to to help you as you go. 
who's going to advise me and counsel me? Well, Commerce Department, SBDC, SCORE, many agencies can help you for free, guide you in how to export. Uh, you're going to need a team to help you when you're ready. For example, at some point, uh, you're going to need to turn to a banker. You're going to need to turn to a freight forwarder. You don't want to wait until you need them. You want to line them up in advance so that when you do need them, you already have them. Uh, and all of those, uh, all of those uh, places where you can get free, free help. Uh, so, so in this stage, you've assessed your readiness and potential. You've, uh, you have uh, uh, gotten advice and assistance on how to export, and you think you know what you're doing. Uh, and so you move to the next step. Uh, okay, if I know what I'm doing, I'm ready to go. Where should I go? Uh, I'm only in the U.S. Should I just start with Canada or Mexico? Well, the first thing you want to do in stage two is figure out which markets make the most sense for you. What are the target markets for you based on your product? And you can get lots of help to tell you that you ought to be in Canada or Mexico or Korea, Japan, Germany, UK, uh, based on the product you make. There's lots of tools that tell you that's where your product is going that your competitors are selling to. So why don't you think about it? So it's not that difficult to identify potential markets. The next thing is once you decide that maybe your potential market is Canada, Mexico, or, or Korea, you need a strategy to get into that market, just as you needed a strategy to, to develop your US market. And part of that strategy is uh, in your market entry plan is uh, what should my strategy be to distribute my product in that market, price it, promote it, and adapt to whatever regulatory uh, considerations there are, like electrical standards or health standards or those kinds of things. And once you uh, once you develop your your distribution, pricing, promotion, and uh, uh, and adaptation adaptation meaning do I have to change my product a little bit? Do I have to alter uh, what I say on my website so it doesn't offend uh, the foreign audience? Those kinds of tinkering to adapt. Uh, uh, you take care of. And, and then don't forget, uh, it's not a piece of paper that we've just done this plan. You don't stick it on the shelf. You execute it. So you want to make sure that you, uh, if it says do this in the next six months or do that in the next six months, try to do it. Okay, after we have uh, gone to stage two, we know which countries to go into, and we know what our entry strategy is in distribution, pro promotion, pricing, and adaptation. Uh, we want to we want to begin to see something happen. We want to see business develop. We want to see uh, inquiries, uh, and we particularly want to see requests for quote, because if we're if we've already positioned ourselves to attract that uh, in the previous stage, then that will begin to flow to us. And you need to know how to respond to a request for quote. Uh, you need to be able to know what inco terms are. That is, if the buyer says, "Well, quote me a price at your factory, and I'll come pick up." The goods there, or quote me a price all the way to Seoul, Korea. Different things. So if they want uh, a price all the way to uh, their country, you're going to factor in transportation costs over and above your your price. Uh, well, you don't know what those are, so you turn to your freight board and says, "Well, here's what your transportation costs include that in your quote." You pass those on to the buyer. You don't absorb that. You pass those on to the buyer, and they understand that. Okay, so you've uh, negotiated your terms, and there's a lot of new technology that helps you interact almost simultaneously and digitally be, with, between buyer and seller. Too complicated to talk about now, but that's a new, uh, a new de technological developed digitalized trade transaction that is, is, is powerful. Uh, the next thing you want to do after you have somebody on the line that's interested, you say, well, uh, how are we going to uh, finance this thing? How are you going to pay them? Uh, and then you need to know what the different methods of payment are. Uh, it's too too much to go through now, but you may have had this in your coursework. You know, there are things like letters of credit, documentary collections, open account, all those kinds of methods of getting paid. Some are more risky than others. Some are very secure, and you need to know which ones are secure and which aren't. Your, your counselor can advise you on that. And even if the buyer says, I'm not going to pay you in advance, I can get that from somebody else. Uh, you better, uh, you know, send me the goods and let me have it for some time and I'll pay you then. That's called open account. And you're saying to yourself, uh-oh, what if he doesn't pay me at the end? 
Well, you probably didn't know that you can uh, get export credit insurance from the U.S. government, the Export Import Bank, that if the buyer fails to pay, you will you will recover your loss. So it, it insures against non-payment. You didn't know that before when you say, I'll never get paid or I don't want to risk it. Yes, you can get paid. By and large, you will get paid. Some of those methods of payment are very secure. Uh, but even at the worst risk, uh, there's export credit insurance to take you through that. Uh, so uh, you figured out that, well, I'm going to get paid by a letter of credit or a documentary collection, or I'm going to sell by open account and, and get export credit insurance to cover any possible loss. And now uh, we've got our deal. Uh, we know what the terms are, the INCO terms, and we're going to sell it all the way to uh, Seoul, Korea. And we factored that in and they said, yes, okay, the deal is there. And so at that point, you need to know stage four, are there any uh, requirements I have to comply with to get the goods from here to there? Yes, there are lots of US export regulations and there are a lot of foreign import regulations. You need to know what those are. Guess what? You don't know, but your freight forwarder does and others, uh, uh, the Department of Commerce and others can tell you, well, if you want to sell that to, uh, uh, to Korea, you've got to make sure it doesn't violate US national security controls. It's not a military item or an item that could be used for military purposes. Doesn't mean you can't export it, just means you might need a license to export it, and there's a way to get that. So don't be deterred by existence of regulations. There are ways to comply with those. Uh, and the US has lots of regulations, but we can tell you what they are. And then you gotta figure out, how, well, are there any foreign regulations I have to, are there import duties over there? Are there quantitative restrictions? Are there uh, what we call non-tariff barriers? that might limit my uh, uh, or impede my ability to get into that market. By and large, most markets are relatively open. That's why there's $17 trillion of imports into those countries. Uh, but uh, we, we can tell you, uh, your counselors can tell you what the regulations are and how to comply with them. And then uh, you, you need to comply with the uh, shipping documents and uh, you don't have to worry about that. Uh, the freight forwarder will help you through all that. They'll prepare the documents for you. And finally, stage five, uh, is get the goods from here to there. You have to make sure the goods are prepared and packed and labeled and marked in a certain way. Freight forwarder can advise you on that. Uh, and you need to use the freight forwarder to actually take the goods from your factory, put them in a container or on a pallet, get it onto the vessel and get it over there. So those are, that's what, uh, you know, lightning speed, what exporting is all about. And uh, if there are any questions where we can go into more detail, I just want to mention one other thing that this opens the door wide to uh, careers. Students uh, may not be aware of the wealth of potential careers in the international trade that all of this, these stages open up and we can, if you ask questions later about what kinds of uh, employers are there uh, for, for me coming out of uh, the university, we can, we can get into that as well. So I'll close it at that point. Right. Thanks a lot, uh, Maurice, and also the Hannon. Uh, thank you so much for both uh, for your informative presentation. Uh, Maurice, I know that given your extensive experiences and uh, your knowledge that uh, I'm sure that you can continue to go on and uh, elaborate on each of these points that you, you went over quickly. Well, now I'd like to ask you a couple of questions related to the key issues both of you addressed uh, before we take some questions from the audience. Audience students, uh, if you'd like to submit questions, please post them in Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, I know, you know some of you are very much interested in pursuing the career. Uh, as Maurice briefly mentioned, actually, that the, anyone who engaged in international trade, export and imports, um, actually their salary, uh, even at the entry level job, is higher than you know, somebody who just uh, uh, had a major in a traditional discipline. So here goes my first question. Uh, Maurice, you briefly touched on this issue in your presentation, but I'd like to further look into it. Um, why do you think many companies uh, still find it difficult to shift their attention from domestic to overseas market? Uh, you mentioned uh, many di different things like, the, you know, whether it's affordable, it's too risky, uh, am I gonna be competitive and et cetera. Is it due to lack of resources or maybe it has to do with some kind of psychological barriers such as language and cultural barriers that make them difficult to communicate with potential importers 
or it could be an uncertainty or risk embedded in international transactions. Would you please list maybe three main challenges companies need to overcome to feel more comfortable with international trade? Yeah, I think the biggest inhibitor for those companies that are just sitting still and selling in the United States instead of taking advantage, it boils down to two things, fear of the unknown. They haven't done it, so I'm afraid of what I might get into. And I tried to say, don't be afraid because we can we can work, walk you through all those uh, fears that you might have. Fear and ignorance. I don't know how. And uh, there's no reason to stop there because, as I tried to explain, there are lots of free sources of how do I export. Some of those are in training sessions, and a lot of it is on the internet. You can go into any number of websites. How do I how do I do this? How do I do that? And you, you get uh, you know you get all kinds of information, but you're not able to necessarily pull it all together yourself. That's why it's important to attend training sessions, go to webinars, contact a counselor. The main thing, all you need to know is, do I have a product that's selling reasonably well in the U.S.? If, if you do, and those are the ones I'm talking to that aren't exporting, uh, there's no reason why we can't walk you through how to expand beyond the U.S. into the other markets. So fear and ignorance are, are the main, uh, I would say, the main deterrents. Okay. Well, Hannah, maybe that uh, you can add anything that uh, given your experience, the companies are coming to you and ask for a, some support. Um, do you agree with those other two main factors he mentioned about fear and also ignorance? And how do you help the companies to overcome these two sort of factors? I think as well as what Morris already shared, um, if I can add one more element, I think the overall expenses, right, to go abroad, um, if you consider all the business development related trips you need to make to certain countries of your target, you know, export, you know, destinations and additional staff members who, you know, you have to hire like translators, right? Attending like international trade shows to promote your products. I mean, everything comes with cost and everything adds up for small business. That is why I think it's so daunting when somebody who is small and start, you know, building their, you know, brand portfolio globally and they, they feel like a, a little bit terrified like where to start um that is why i think you know the state government we try to provide like funding resources to offset a portion of the expenses for small business therefore encourage them to consider export but uh, isn't it true i mean there has been a digitalization of a lot of these what uh, uh, the exports now that you know e-commerce has become really um Bad. A lot of companies, they don't necessarily have to go all the way to, you know, many different countries. They can sell from home, but still considered to be, you know, the expert. So have you seen some kind of change in the trend that a lot of companies that they don't have to necessarily go far distance and but they feel that, they, you know, we can handle this from home? This really depends on the products, what you are trying to sell, I think. Um, people may think, hey, e-commerce save money but really depends on the market, for example, like China. Uh -huh. So e-commerce channel, there's a lot of competitions because doing business on e-commerce, everybody thinks it's you know, cheaper than traditional distribution, you know, the distribution channel and also like, you know, stores, right? Things like that. But the competition is humongous, like how you make your brand stand out. And if you are paying significant online marketing fee, to mm -hmm. an e-commerce platform to promote your brands for a short period of time. I mean, that's gonna cost a fortune as well. So it, business really have to evaluate, right? Their products, who are their target clients? What is the best uh, the best supply chain for them to consider distribution mm -hmm. and calculated cost? I could, I could add to that. There's a, I think a mythology developing that uh, internet is gonna take over, e-commerce is gonna take over. All I have to do is put up a shopping cart and I'll get get rich. Uh, it doesn't work that way in international trade. The traditional method of entering the market is not e-commerce sales. Uh, you're not going to sell machine tools e-commerce. The traditional way is to find a distributor in the market uh, and let the distributor find customers. And there are low-cost services of the Commerce Department to help you find a qualified distributor. That doesn't mean you can't uh, have a shopping cart and, and export e-commerce, but that's more limited to small 
small scale sales and consumer goods. Mm-hmm. Don't, don't, don't get, uh, and also it depends on the health of your, and the quality of your website. Uh, you start with a website and if it's with made for US audience, uh, just the content of it, you know, the colors on it, the symbology on it, any, uh, you know, the, the words you use on it, you, you have to adapt those to a foreign audience. Even if you have a shopping cart, you want your basic message to be um, understood in a, in a good way and not in an offensive way. All right. So that also includes, you know, the cultural aspect and then also the language and, and et cetera. So you cannot use the exactly same way you used to in the domestic market. Uh, another question I have is uh, I used to work for a country economist at the Export Import Bank of Korea before I came over to the States. Uh, I think one of the important thing is that because you talked about knowledge, I mean, ignorance and fear. Um, so a lot of companies, they have to do a good job to try to what uh, locate and find the right place and right country. How important do you think that uh, evaluate the sort of country risk of the um, target market and what kind of resources are available in order to sift through, you know, the, which country seems to be the safest, particularly for those novice and beginner who never been to international trade. Can you just uh, walk through us that the steps that uh, it, it might be helpful for them to find out and identify that uh, probably that the safest market? Uh, yeah, I, I uh, generally think in terms of uh, which markets are best in, in two, put in two buckets. One is what I call a high comfort market and the other batch is a high potential market. Mm-hmm. A high comfort market May not be a high potential market. Let's say you you're you're uh, you're from Honduras or Guatemala or 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 even Korea. Uh, Honduras and Guatemala may be not large markets, but you may feel entirely comfortable exporting to those countries because you know everything about them culturally. You know the people. You have connections, and you can start there with a relative ease. Uh, but if you want to find uh, the tar- uh, markets with the high potential. Uh, first, you get somebody that can advise you. That, uh, but what they look at is the first clue is the statistics. Right. So if you make uh, if you make widgets, uh, widgets has a what we call a harmonized code number or a Schedule B number, mm-hmm. and you can look at the uh, U.S. export statistics for U.S. exports of products with that number, and it will tell you which are the uh, largest and fastest growing markets for for widgets like yours. Okay, your competitors are getting all that business, you're not, but that's a clue. So if 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 your analysis says the the top five uh, leading and fast growing markets that have continued uh, are probably higher potential than markets which are going downhill or going like this. So that's the first uh, clue as to what a high potential market is. And then you begin to look further into the market research available on those countries which is a free, a lot of that is free country information and free product information. So then you get a substantive view of the uh, of the potential in the market. An advisor uh, can help you through all that at no cost. Well, it's uh, eventually it's a trade-off between that, uh, you know, your, your return and uh, your risk. So if you want to make a big buck, you have to assume that uh, you're willing to take a risk uh, but on the other hand, that uh, if you want to go to the safest route um, as a first step, then certainly that uh, you know you can export. That's the reason why that the uh, majority of the American companies we export to Mexico or Canada because mm-hmm. it's uh, much easier and the comfort zone is higher. So, Hannah, you mentioned about that you gave us a list of those uh, the countries that we export to and import from. So at this particular moment, did you find that uh, a lot of American companies are particularly interested in a specific market? What are the sort of hot market for the California companies and uh, like Vietnam or Taiwan? And then can you name a uh, few just the countries? I know it depending on the products and services they're uh, you know, dealing with, but uh, were you able to find some kind of trend? 
I think because of, of our geological location, right, we're facing Asia Pacific Rim, so it makes sense. A lot of our export export destination is in Asia, uh-huh. and that that the East Asia is covering like fifty five percent of two way trade, which including both export and import. But right. overall, the largest trading partner is still our neighbors, right? Like Mexico and Canada. And mm-hmm. then, you know, another really big, you know, trading partner is with China. Um, I guess for each business consideration um, regarding how to select your market, I agree with Maurice on the research side, but, you know, how big is the country, is the market, right? If you want to, you know, extend like, bigger consumer market, right? Like major countries, you, you consider the population, you consider the you know, similarity of the products in that market, you know, competitive price. If you have a specific niche or, or advantage of your brands to penetrate into that market, that is why the, you know, employees who have like research and analytical skills will really help driving, you know, that pr- proposal list down, right? Like compare different Political environment, you know, how comfort um, you enter into this market, how big is the market, how much challenge it has, um, how fierce the competition, domestic competition is. I think a lot of the factors will have to be considered before you make your priorities. Um, even just with Southeast Asia, I mean, there's tons of potential emerging markets, right? Vietnam, in Malaysia, Philippines, Singapore. With which one to start? I mean, of course, start with one country the overall cost is lower than if you start multiple countries at the same time. Mm -hmm. So how to reduce the risk? I think that really needs like further consultation. Mm -hmm. Um, US commercial service, um, you know, US office, they have so many regional office could help with um, that initial market entry strategy analysis. Um, So I do encourage um, companies, especially for new to export, to work with your local US commercial service team. Try Uh to get Well, we have many students attending this webinar. Uh, I'm sure some of them wants to be involved in international trade or work for a company which is engaged in foreign direct investment after graduation. How do you think they can acquire skills and competencies required to be successful in international trade? Um, Do you suggest any courses for students to take or any other just a you know, the recommendations that for the students to be prepared um, if they are interested in pursuing the, the, the career in international trade. Let's begin with uh, Maurice. Yes, well, uh, <laughs> young son uh, knows that I have uh, kind of complained a little bit about the uh, the teaching in the, in the universities in the international trade field. It's, uh, it's uh, more, it's highly academic and not so much practical. Mm-hmm. And for students, uh, you know, coming, uh, graduating and they're looking for jobs, uh, you know, you can go to a, you can learn on the job or you can be prepared to start running on the job when you get there. Now, in order to do the latter, if you can't get it in the existing curriculum, you, 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 uh, you think in terms of the internships or externships uh, with businesses, uh, practical experiences uh, in extracurricular uh, areas. Uh, or, you know, look for uh, webinars like this and other training uh, uh, programs. But there are, there are quite a few ways that students can become more job ready uh, if they look for these other uh, opportunities. Yeah. Okay. Hannah? I, I think, I mean, I graduated as an international trade major years ago. And um, after that, I pursue a career path related to trade promotion, you know, trade shows and international, you know, business development. Um, I feel, and I also participate and observe really closely on some of the internship that support, you know, students um, to engage with business directly on international field. So I feel there's a, a couple of, you know, qualities that may help students um, with specific talent to get into the trade world. Um, number one is research and uh, analytical um, skills, especially, you know, you're starting from an intern or, you know, junior staff. You try to help your company provide like data analysis and research, um, for example, like market entry analysis, mm-hmm. um, help your boss do research on potential like compliance regulation in specific countries. I, I think these type of skill, skills is really come handy 
um, wow. when there's a lot of like, uh, you know, preparing material, preparing, like meeting preparing for, for your supervisors. Mm -hmm. um, another good skill I think uh, is really good to develop um, during college years is presentation skills, like communication, writing skills. Imagine you are into like marketing, you know, that that angle uh, for, for a company or having to do international trade. You might be asked to pre prepare a presentation to talk about your products, what is your you know competitive advantage in certain country. So be able to really deliver that in a cultural conscience and in a you know timely and professional manner. I think this is really important. Presentation is not easy, but it is not, you know, everybody could do a really, really good, you know, that teach that for, for the companies. Um, another thing which is not necessary, but you know, if you have that, which is can, can consider uh, being a plus, is if you have specific language skills other than just English. We're working with companies that want to penetrate like Japan market, and um, it, it really needs somebody like staff members who can communicate in Japanese in those potential business meetings. Mm -hmm. So if you have specific language skills or advantage, I think it's easier for your boss to you know bring you into different trips or you know business negotiation you know uh, meetings to help you know translate not only language but also the culture difference and you know prevent any misunderstandings. Okay. Um, I remember one of the course I took um, really helped me a lot is um, it's called international supply chain management, which not only managing um, the concept of you know export but you know import as well like where you source your products, you know, how much uh, raw materials um, you need to um, source and in order to supply your production in the US and then in order to export. So um, mm -hmm. I think keep updated um, yourself on all those potential tools and knowledge and software during school years is really important because you will find, you know, once you're full-time employee at a company, it's very hard to keep tracking of all these new tools and, you know, method and resources. And the last I would say, just, you know, try every opportunity you could, if you want to work in the international trade field during your college years or even graduate years, try opportunity that have like internship opportunities with potential, um, you know, trading companies or, you know, government agencies, right? You have commercial service okay. or, you know, state government agencies who are doing trade. I mean. But tap into those fields as early as possible, so we will, you will learn from practical, you know, day-to-day -day operations that where you are laid off, and you still have time to improve that skills. Okay, that's great. I know that, as a matter of fact, that the, the governor's office, they, they offer a, some great internship opportunity, right? So, um... yeah, I mean, we just take on a um, fellowship, executive fellow, um, um, it's I think it's annual program. Um, every year is starting from um, fall. The application is starting from fall, and the program was lasting for like eight months or so. So um, yeah, sometimes we have those long term programs, and sometimes depending on the pro program manager, they, they may have a like, short term interns. Yeah. So we're happy to share those information once available. I'd be happy to pass that information to my students that they, if you provide me more specific sort of what the, the job description of the any internship. My students might be interested. Absolutely. Kind of related question I have uh, from one of my students in my international business class, uh, Cameron. What does the typical career path look like for someone in international trade? So he's interested in the typical career path that if somebody's interested in pursuing a career in international trade. Maurice? Well, it, it, uh, the career path depends on what uh, organization you start with. The career path, if you start with a U.S. government agency, as I did, the U.S. Department of Commerce, where I spent 33 years coming out of graduate school, I had no practi practical uh, skills at that time, so I had to learn on the job. Uh -huh. the, the one thing you do get out of uh, the, uh, the the coursework is uh, critical thinking skills. That'll take you a long way, and I can't uh, emphasize the importance of that. But in, in, in my case, uh, I started as a junior desk officer. On a couple of countries, then I expanded to uh, strategic uh, planning, covering all of our export uh, promotion activities. Then I got into the international trade research area and began directing all of those programs. So there's a, a career progression in in government. 
if you start with a company, you come in as a junior, uh, you know, uh, on the job, you might get um, assigned, if it's a large company, you might get assigned to the finance department or the or the uh, traffic, the reporting department or the manufacturing, you know, the different uh, tracks within the large corporation. If you go into a small business that's selling in the U.S. or even exporting, uh, you might, you know, get into the marketing and sales uh, area. Uh, the finance area, you know, there are different paths within within every organization that you can advance through. Well, I'm going to pick up one more question before we wrap up this uh, webinar. This question goes to Hannon. What are the, some of the avenues for establishing relationships in a foreign market? Because you mentioned a few things about trade show and, you know, that sort of things. How is it at uh, to utilize trade shows for these means? And also, what are the difficult or challenges in managing these relationships in a competitive market? Yeah, that's a really great question. I think um, to establish relationship with foreign partners through networking events, period. Um, the networking events ha can happen here in California and also can happen in overseas market. For example, if you, know, you are working for a company who want to, again, export to Japan, there's a plenty of Japanese associations in California who are like, you know, Japan Chamber of Commerce, uh, right? In Northern California, Japan um, Association in Southern California. There are members of Japanese companies and um, who, you know, maybe headquartered in Japan, but, you know, expanded the US market. They do a lot of networking events. And if you want to know like potentially Japanese companies or Japan contact, join those events in California, um, you know, networking and start to build your uh, relationship there. Um, online tool, there's a lot of like LinkedIn, so you can connect to people uh, through networking as well. Uh, a more expensive way, but probably more practical way um, as well is, you know, try to join international trade shows. That is a huge, like trade shows is a huge networking opportunity for, you know, business branding. But again, it's a more co costly option. Uh, but really tap into the country and feel, you know, feel it, feel the market and get, could get you a more accurate sense of, you know, whether or not your potential products have a market, right, in that country. See who are the competitors, learn and, you know, be the eyes and ears for, for your company and for your boss and just to absorb and learn and collect information going back and follow up. I think a lot of those networking could, you know, your clients and distributor relationship in the long run. Okay. But I add one more thing about uh, getting uh, hired. Uh, um, there is a credential for international trade professionals that didn't exist before, but now exists. There's a national exam to become a certified global trade professional CT, CGBP. Right. So if you're if you're an accountant, you get a CPA, and you got a better chance of getting a job in accounting. If you're a CGBP and you pass the exam, and you know it's not an easy exam, you have a better chance of getting. Uh, you have an edge over somebody that just has an international trade degree. Mm -hmm. And NASPITE is the organization that administers the CGBP uh, credential and exam. And LMU is the recipient of a lot of the training materials, in particular, to help prepare you for that uh, exam. So, because you mentioned the CGBP, so if somebody has passed that exam, actually, that the, their salary and compensation would be higher than someone that who doesn't have the kind of credential. Uh, not necessarily. What I'm saying is, if you go into a, an interview with a CGBP and you're competing against somebody with a, a degree in international trade, uh, if the if the employer is more interested in how you can start <laughs> quick right away and contribute. You have an edge. Okay. All right. Thanks. Maybe Hannon, that uh, the final question from one of our students is maybe you can reply, respond that uh, he's asking about website or resources that contain analytical helpful information on the import and export statistics within California. Would you be able to find some of the website and then maybe you can directly respond to the student question? Uh, I would appreciate that. Great. Well, yeah. uh, you know, unfortunately that we are running out of time. Um, thanks again, Hannah and Maurice for talking to LMD community out of your very busy schedule today. Uh, we really appreciate your time and contribution to this webinar. Finally, I'd like to thank all of you who joined the webinar today. I hope that you have enjoyed the program. 
uh, we'll be back with another program in March. So please stay safe and healthy until then. Before you leave, I would like to ask you to fill out a brief survey at the end of this webinar, and that will be very helpful to get your feedback. Thank you so much, everyone, and good night. Thank you.